Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Janet, um, and the C2ES team for um, asking me to participate in this event. Um, it's, it's terrific to see the increasing engagement and leadership of the private sector on, on the climate issue. And one thing that's certainly clear is that if we are going to have um, make a significant uh, take on this issue of climate change in, in a significant way, both the public and private sector really do need to take uh, ambitious action. And President Obama is committed to leading this on this issue. Uh, the President's Climate Action Plan, when fully uh, implemented, will cut nearly 6 billion tons of carbon pollution by through 2030, which is equivalent to taking all the cars in the United States off the road for more than four years. And while the United States is leading internationally and doing its part domestically on addressing the climate change issue, uh, hundreds of private companies, local governments, and philanthropies have stepped up also in increasing energy efficiency, uh, boosting low carbon investing, as well as working to make energy, clean energy, renewable energy accessible to all. The private sector, obviously, as just, um, Bob talked about here today, is also increasingly looking towards integrating climate risks into their business operation management plans. And this is not always an easy task, as Bob clearly laid, laid out today, um, to know, that is, it's not always easy to know what does it mean to, to mainstream uh, climate risks, to integrate climate risks into your short and long-term business plans. And this is a new lens that all of us uh, really need to begin to adjust to. Because uh, even with significant actions that we are leading and I believe the, the, the world will take, there are changes that will continue to happen uh, for years and decades ahead. The reality is that w the, the climate within which our communities are built our, our economies were developed, and the structured safety nets that we have developed is no longer what we've expected and what we've structured our societies to be. To rethinking that uh, is the challenge that we face. So for example, by the middle of this century, the average American will likely experience two to three times the average annual number of 95 degree days that they have experienced over the last 30 years. And that's an average. In certain pockets in the country, certain pockets in the world, those numbers are much, uh, much more dramatic. And I think often when we see reports, it's important to remember that. We characterize the average of the world. We characterize the average of the US. But the average includes real extremes in some places uh, that we need to remember when we think about the real impact on people um, and economies of the world. And similar shifts are uh, happening in precipitation. For example, in the US, if you look just historically of what the changes have been, over the last 40 years, extreme events that used to be one in five year events are now becoming one in three, one in four year events. And this might not seem like a very dramatic change, but as this trend, ha as the trend continues, the implications will be extremely dramatic, um, both locally and globally, if we don't begin to recalibrate our risks moving forward. And while some sectors are being hit harder than others, some regions are being hit harder than others, and certainly will be in the future, what is clear is that no region, no sector is immune. The National Climate Projection, uh, National Climate Assessment, I should rather say, is, projects that the frequency and intensity of extreme precipitation events, for, for example, um, are likely, are expected to increase uh, throughout all regions in the US. The critical thing when we think about these impacts and these projections that we've all heard various versions of is that it forces us to rethink how we manage our operations um, of water resources, of food systems, of energy systems, of health systems, and of course for the private sector, the, the multifaceted supply chains that support so many of our businesses. But so what does it mean to rethink the management and operation plans and account for these risks. The one thing I always hear from people, and this was articulated in the report here, is if I only knew 
in 2050, at 1230 in New York City, what the climate would be like, my problems would be solved. But clearly, you know, that's not going to solve your problem. That's not, we can't, the solution here isn't just to take projections, the new projections of what the climate is today versus what it was before, or what it's going to be in the future versus what it is today, and just, may, and just integrate those new projections into the models that we have today. The challenge that we really face is rethinking how we do our planning. Because the, the climate has not changed, it is changing and will continue to change. And the feedbacks and the implications of those changes for our society, for our business structures, for our ecosystems that have feedbacks, there are uncertainties in that process. We really are doing an experiment with our globe. We're doing an experiment with our cities. We're doing an experiment with our businesses. And so managing climate risk is less about taking downscaled projections for 1215 at in the year 2050 in New York City, but really managing for a changes in the future and the unexpected. So I wanted to, as I think, as we think about that challenge, how does it, what does it mean to plan for change and not to plan for one specific change? I wanted to talk a little bit to the challenges that Bob highlighted that are articulated in this report. And I thought I'd say just a few words about each one of them in the context of what we're doing um, in the Obama administration. The first is data and tools, and this is sort of perhaps one of the larger ones that comes out um, in the report as well as in many conversations that I had. A key area for actionable science. Uh, this is, this is an, I indeed a true challenge. Um, sometimes the challenge is there's so much information, I just don't know where to find it. And sometimes the challenge is we actually don't know the answer to that question. And you know what? We might actually not know it for a long time. But, the challenge, but what, we, what we're faced with is we have to make the decision, given the information that we have today, and assume that it will be improved over time. So first is getting the information. Getting the information in the masses of information um, in the information age, it's always so amazing to me that, in fact, it's often challenging to get the information that we need on something so uh, important as, as climate risk management. But the reality is one of the reasons it's so, it's so difficult is that even though there's a vast amount of information, it's really difficult to say um, to provide generalized guidelines that this is the information you should use. Because so often, the information that you need to use and how to use it is very unique to your situation. So how do you scale that personalized information? We've done it well with weather. You know, we're able to say, to plan very specifically, and you're going on a trip, what, you know, should I bring an umbrella? What kind of clothes should I bring? And, 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 de and detailed. But to do that in terms of the projections, in terms of understanding how we manage risks a decade out, two decades out, four decades out, is, is quite, uh, quite a bit more challenging because there's so many local variables and local feedbacks that we need to integrate. But we are making progress on it. Um, the uh, Obama administration uh, launched, as part of the Climate Action Plan, cli uh, the Climate Data Initiative, which is really focused on trying to address this issue. Let's get together the challenge of the climate data initiative is well, let's focus within the federal government where so much of the uh, fundamental data exists or is generated and organize that and make it accessible and usable. For and we started off with some specific sectors. We focused on health, coasts, ecosystems, food security, and others. And, try and look to organize it, make it accessible, and then in, as, a parallel, and as a parallel process develop and organize the tools that help communities, <coughs> businesses analyze those tools for sp those specific decision making. It's an, we've made a lot of progress. We have work to, to go for sure. Um, and I think we're beginning to go from a sectorial and theme based in terms of accessing that information to really a demand based, to working with partners and saying, okay, within this information, what specifically do you need? And how can we look at that in a scalable way so we can have direct, inf uh, respond to direct information needs in a more uh, scalable fashion. And in terms of actionable res research, 
uh, I think there was an interesting exchange with uh, the gentleman from UCAR. And I guess I would argue that a lot of that research that needs to be done to make actionable information isn't, doesn't necessarily sit directly at a university. I would say that it has to be, it has to emerge out of a sustained dialogue between practitioners, decision makers, and researchers. And I think that the uh, progress has also been made uh, tremendously on that with institutions. For, for example, this report I think is, is, a, it is a move towards that because it does, it is, it does emerge out of a dialogue between the private sector and, and the research community. Um, and the National Climate Assessment, which was mentioned earlier by Bob, which comes out of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, is another example where this is happening. The National Climate Assessment, this, the most recent one, was focused on uh, really setting up a network of, of practitioners that was fed into what should this research be, and what information project should happen. And I was actually a lead author on the Sustain Assessment Report for the National Climate Assessment. And one of the focuses there was, if we're going to have a sustained assessment meeting, if we're going to have research that produces regular reports and information products that, the, that our society needs, we need to build partnerships. That was a fundamental underlying comment of the sustained assessment report. We can't, government can't do it by itself. We need to, as we get closer and closer to that decision making process, have some sustained dialogues between decision makers, scientists, and, and government. So let me turn to, I'll be shorter on the last three. I think that one was uh, one of the biggest challenges. Uncertainty and unexpected, um, the uncertainty in, the, in it expected impacts. This is just a given. Um, there will always be an uncertainty in the unexpected impacts. Uh, and as I mentioned before, what we need to do while we focus on trying to narrow those down and putting limits on that, we also have to expect them and develop our plans with that in mind. So what does that mean? That means we have to think about adaptation pathways, not just one adaptation plan. We have to think about that that is going to change. And what are the moments that we have to, that we should, what are the moments in those plans, what are the thresholds that we might look for? At which point we say, we're going to have to rethink this plan at this stage. And what's the information that we need for that? So think about adaptation pathways that rather than one concrete adaptation plan. Um, so short versus long term uh, time frames. This is certainly a challenge because we're faced now with extreme events. We're faced with this, this incredible intensity that's increasing in the frequency. And we see this as climate. And, and while we can't, as you know, the expression, we can't say any one event is um, driven by climate change. We know that climate is changing. and all of these are happening within the context of a changed climate. But yet planning for those, <coughs> managing those short-term risks isn't necessarily the same as planning for the long-term risks. The approaches and the information are different. But I think one of the key areas where we can connect those is, again, what Bob mentioned, is this thinking about rebuilding after disasters. Um, managing sort of short risks and seeing those um, rebuilding, as if, if you will, as opportunities for thinking about restructuring and preparing for the future. And what it, that's one of the things that the Obama administration has really focused on, is in providing incentives and competitions for um, local governments and regions to begin to think in a resilience framework for, for, de for rebuilding after disaster. So finally, out of date or inadequate standards. Um, this is, I think this is an important issue and, and insufficient guidelines. Um, I think this is an important issue that the main screening of climate risks, integrating risks into our standard practices and getting those into the standards, engineering standards and building standards is critical. And doing that um, uh, partly perhaps is a cultural thing that's taken so long and partly it's because we don't have enough experience to necessarily what, say what those should be. Um, but I think there is progress being made. Um, the U.S. government is certainly pushing that on the floods standards side as well as building guidelines and um, best practices. And part of that, and a lot of that, is emerging out of public-private partnerships that we have developed. One with the insurance industry, so that the, the insurance industry can have access to the best data to, to ensure that the um, programs that they set are based on, on the real risks. We have um, a partnership with the energy sector to look at energy resilience and, and create that sustained dialogue so that we can build the systems and information system that responds to their needs. Um, and then importantly, we've also uh, had 
uh, had a state and local uh, government and tribal task force, which provided the government with guidance of what is needed and creating that dialogue across government uh, levels to support and direct resor resources going forward. So I think there are a lot of ch challenges to managing climate risks. It's, it's not a simple thing. I often say that, um, that climate mitigation is actually really easy. You know, We know what we need to do. We need to get off of fossil fuels. Climate risk management, climate resilience, building climate resilience is tough. And it's going to be tough for a while. And one thing is clear is we really need to work together, public sector and private sector, academics and civil society. Um, and so I'm very, it's very encouraging to see this, uh, this uh, discussion here today. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts about what else the government should be doing. So uh, with that, I, I just want to um, say thank you to Janet and the C2ES team for the good work you've done and including me in this event. Thank you. Sure. Anyone over? Yeah. Is there, am I waiting for a microphone or should I just call? Sorry. <laughs> so much light I can't see. Thank you. Good morning. Nick Shufro with PricewaterhouseCoopers. I work with the UN Office uh, for Disaster Risk Reduction. We have a global program. We had an event last Friday uh, focused on the insurance industry and the city of Boston. Um, and one of the things that you brought up last, one of your last points was around working with different sectors. I think the, uh, the point that I wanted to make was looking at sort of the derivative um, decision makers. So as an example, when you're working with insurance companies, one of the things that we found out was that insurance companies rely on reinsurers and they rely on um, state insurance regulations. So when you actually start to peel back the proverbial onion, there are a number of different players that you need to look at and speak with. And I was wondering what you're doing to try and engage with the derivative uh, stakeholders. Yeah, I think that's a, um, a really good point. You know, there's there's an ecosystem of actors out there and we need to make sure that we can connect with all of them. And I think it's a challenge. Um, I think that our, the public-private partnerships, there have been a number of them. We're exploring developing others in terms of how to integrate uh, that broader ecosystems of risk managers. Um, and I think it's, it's a process and, and we're, we're doing it bit by bit. I'm Amy Christensen with the Sun Valley Institute for Resilience. And um, one thing that you mentioned was the HUD program, the National Disaster Resilience Competition, where the jurisdictions across the country are working to rebuild better. And I think the partnership with Rockefeller Foundation there to train those jurisdictions on resilience to strengthen their plans for rebuilding has been a good model. But I would say the integration of the private sector into that conversation has been less so, although there's been a bit of that kind of jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So I'm curious about how we can strengthen the engagement of the private sector from that the HUD, the HUD role or the Rockefeller Foundation role or others in philanthropy more strategically do that um, versus on a case-by-case -case basis. I was working with the state of Washington team and we brought in Microsoft and some technologies that they could bring to bear, but it seems there's less of that kind of systemic integration to think about where those companies are operating and how they can be partners in this. And then second of all, uh, you talked about what more the federal government can do and your engagement with the energy sector. And it does seem, there was a question earlier about the role of clean energy versus dirty in the, in the resilience um, piece. And I was thinking about the role of distributed generation and what we're finding, I've been to the Rocky Mountain Institute's electricity innovation labs, is the solutions are often distributed clean energy combined with storage for Hoboken and other areas. So, but it seems like the federal government through FERC and otherwise could help be providing that kind of guidance for energy resilience recognizing that those solutions will also benefit on the mitigation side. So I was curious if you've looked at the role of FERC or others to help drive energy resilience, electricity resilience, infrastructure improvements specifically. Thank you. Yeah, great question, Jamie. Um, so on the first point in terms of scaling up this model where Rockefeller was involved with HUD on um, the redesign process, I, I think that's an 
it's a very important point and something that we are certainly exploring and would love any any companies here that are involved to 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 talk with about is is that you know I think the the challenge is that so many uh, climate resilience efforts are collective goods, right? And how can we scale that example of, which is often a regional piece of saying, you know, there are, uh, there are, someone brought up the example that there are weather stations. There are weather stations that someone's paying and the government's running them. There are one-offs of this I hear all the time, and one of the things that we've been exploring was how do you scale that? How can you have that sustained dialogue? Again, I raised this before. Um, where it's not just a one-off conversation, but as to St. Dollar, where you can see those opportunities and say, yes, it's a win-win for us all to be putting, investing together in solving this solution. And I think that is certainly on the table of things that we're exploring and would love in engagement with anybody who, who's interested in getting involved in, in ideas of how to scale that. The second issue in terms of the energy, certainly I think the focus of the Department of Energy's public-private partnership that's really focused on energy resilience uh, is, is focused on these sorts of issues. There's an ongoing dialogue that's, that was recently launched um, that's really focused specifically on how can, we, uh, how can we integrate and think about energy from a resilience lens moving forward and, and, per, and have that percolate across, across the nation and hopefully the world. Other questions? I think that's it. Oh, one. Do we have one time for one more? Hi, uh, Nora Vogel uh, with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, and I was just building off that last question, I was wondering if you see any other, you know, energy is um, definitely one of those areas where uh, there's some overlap between uh, measures that will improve resilience and measures that actually advance mitigation as well. Um, and I was wondering if you see any opportunities outside the energy sector or if there's anything else, you know, besides storage, which was just mentioned, um, that you see falling into that category. A huge amount. Um, answers are overwhelmingly yes. <laughs> um, I've, it's actually an issue I've been focused on for many years. Um, and I mean, I think water, right, and especially in, you know, I come from California and 20% and, uh, of our energy use, 18% is used moving water and processing water. Um, and so as you think about uh, managing water risks, you are uh, inevitably thinking also about energy. And, um, uh, and it goes vice versa as well. Our food systems um, are when we manage our landscapes. And uh, so when we're managing our, uh, when we're thinking about um, managing our landscapes, um, you know, one way of, of thinking about it is managing it for carbon. Another way is thinking about it is managing it for climate risks and having carbon be, um, be uh, a co-benefit, if you will. And I think if we do manage our landscapes and our, our water systems for, for climate risks effectively uh, and for broader sustainability issues, I, I am confident um, that we would get, we will, it will fall out that there will be a lot of carbon benefits that will, re will result. I'm told to wrap up now, so thank you so much.